Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to February 28th, 2023. This is the last Tuesday we will ever get in February 2023. Golly, I can't believe it. 40 years ago when I set out here on this earth, I never thought we'd get to this day, February 2023. Never even crossed my mind, but yet here we are, and uh, we're here to talk about mules and donkeys. Hopefully, you're here to talk a little bit about mules and donkeys with us as well. My name is Dave, this is Steve Edwards, and that's what we do every single week. Uh, on Tuesdays, get together to talk mules and donkeys. This week's no exception, and we're super glad to have you hanging out with us. Uh, the way it works is that, uh, well, number one, you're here, so well done. So glad that you're here. Uh, you share your name, where you're watching from, and uh, uh, what the weather's like. That's the first thing, because we want to know that you're here. Uh, we don't like just to, like, I'm staring at a camera right now, and it's pretty pointless if it's just me and Steve, like just staring at a camera. But if we know that you're there hanging out with us, well, then it has all of the purpose in the world. So share your name, where you're watching from, what the weather's like. The second thing that we ask is that you uh, put out any and every mule or donkey question that you've got because you drive this program. We want to make sure that you have the tools and the information you need to get out there and get results. And then the third thing we ask is that you share the broadcast with friends and family. So, uh, Steve, how have things been since this time last week? Well, by God, we've been getting rain. We're talking about getting more rain tomorrow, which would be a good deal. It's 59 degrees right now. I was just looking at the weather here. But uh, in looking at my weather forecast at 2 p.m., there's a 40% chance of rain. Now, earlier, they were saying it's 100% chance of rain. So you know what? I don't think they completely know what's going on, but I know somebody that does. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was watching this show. Uh, you remember Tim the Tool Man Taylor? Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh. Home improvement. So he was uh, he was on a, a show called Last Man Standing, and in one of the first episodes, uh, he uh, he met one of his neighbors or something like that who was a weather person, and he just looks at her and he goes, "So how does it feel to know your entire career has been replaced by a ninety nine cent app?" Well, I just died laughing. I thought that was the funniest thing ever. And uh, anytime we talk about the weather, that's all I can really think about is uh, how is it to have your entire meteorologist career destroyed by a 99 cent app? I know there's more to it than that, but it sure is funny. So, uh, folks, go ahead, introduce yourself in the comment section, your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like. I want to say hello to David Pengelly. Uh, he is coming to us from Manchester, Georgia today, but soon enough... Mr. Pengelly is going to find himself in where, Steve? Where is Mr. Pengelly going to be? Hey, not only is Mr. Pengelly going to be there, but I'm going to tell you, we got a bunch of folks going to be there. And I was just looking uh, just a minute ago on my email, and uh, I think her, her name is Miranda, Miranda, let's see, Miranda Trout. Uh, she's going to be there as well. And she's coming all the way from Arkansas. Listen, we got folks coming from all over the United States coming to this clinic up here in Superior, and it's going to be great. Yeah, so I'm putting information right now, a uh, link to Montana Clinic in the comment section. Uh, all of the details, we've been talking about it because we want to make sure that when June rolls around, nobody says, hey, I didn't hear about this. I didn't have time to plan. No, you've got plenty of time to plan, and we're going to make sure that you've got as much time uh, pl to plan as possible. So that's why we're mentioning it every week. More folks are signing up as every week's go by, and we sure do hope that you'll be able to join us. So David Pingelli, uh, Mr. Coffee by David himself, Mr. I'll ship you come along coffee anywhere, uh, anytime, is watching from Manchester, Georgia. Leon is watching uh, from Parsons, Tennessee, where it's a beautiful day, he says. Uh, Bruce is watching from Texas, 82 and clear. That's how it's looking there. Uh, Daryl and Bobby Joe are watching from Alabama, where it is sunny and 84 degrees. Uh, Sherman Johnson, Johnson's Taxidermy, Norman, Oklahoma, 68 degrees. Jim Rhodes, Western Maryland, 44 degrees with winds gusting to 50 miles per hour. I'll tell you what, Steve, uh, last week it was uh, probably Tuesday morning, and my nine-year-old comes out just home, home, home. And, you know, he's wanting you to ask him how he's doing. <laughs> Isaac, what's going on, buddy? Oh, I don't feel good. 
What is it? Oh, it's my stomach. You're like, oh, buddy, what? I'm sorry. What do you think it is? I don't know. I'm like, do you think you'll be okay to go to school? No. Well, I dig, and I dig some more, and I dig a little more. Finally, I hear him say, it's supposed to be really windy today. And that's why he wasn't feeling super good. He was he was very concerned about the 50 mile per hour winds that were going to be blowing over the desert and didn't want to get swept away. And so I had to assure him, hey, it's going to be okay. So uh, Jim's got that 50 mile per hour. So if Isaac's ever out there, Jim, you can comfort him too. Hey, Merlin is here watching live Northwest Minnesota, 22 degrees and sunny. Here is the first question of the day. This one comes from Merlin. How does cold weather affect beta equipment? Now, Steve, tell us why Merlin would be asking about beta equipment, and then how does the cold weather affect it? Well, beta equipment is about the best you can get. It has a nylon core and kind of a rubbery type exterior. I have had it in Montana at 20 below. I've had it in Arizona at 120 degrees. It is awesome. I like it over leather. Leather, if you don't keep it super oiled, it will crack and this sort of thing. I have yet to see this stuff do anything but do good. And uh, I even, uh, I, I can tell you, I've taken all of my tack, all of my britches, all of my breast collars, uh, off of my pack saddles, off of my, all my harnesses, all beta and, and, uh, and uh, is beta. <laughs> and biofane, there we go, lost it. Uh, one of them new moments. Anyway, um, I've, I've, and all of it, I've got rid of my leather, all that leather strapping. My saddle is uh, Cordura and leather. Uh, one of them, of course, I've got, I've got one of each saddle, but uh, it's Cordura and leather. And I, I, uh, I am flat done with beta. So to answer your question, it's been really good. I haven't had any complaints and I don't have any myself. The thing about me, folks, is I've used it. Uh, I Anything that I have is what I've designed. My britchen uh, is not like anybody else's. It has a completely different design and it's made out of beta and and uh, I, I love it. Uh, it also, I also have leather britchen and breast collars too, folks. But for the most part, if I'm going to have something, it is not going to be where I have to oil it and maintain it all the time. That's the problem with leather is every strap that has a bend on it, you know, a bend like this. Okay. Anytime there's a bend to go over something, that part's going to crack. Just go out and look at your stuff. And by the way, check your, check your tack all the time. While we're talking about tack, your britches are moving all the time. This is the back of your two straps. They're britches are moving like this. And the, uh, the, the conchos that hold the britchen on are constantly getting beat on by these two straps that are going back and forth because the hip of the mule is moving. So check your conchos. Check every place where there's, where there's going to be an attaching part. Check your holes in your straps and stuff like this. Now, beta is almost indestructible. But you especially want to look, watch your conchos on my saddles uh, with, they hold the conchos, big conchos hold on the, the britching in the back, but check them out. But it's great stuff. Awesome. Uh, next question. This one came from Jill. Jill says, uh, do you have any riding mules for sale that would work for kids or do you have any recommendation? And so as always, uh, I'd give the disclaimer that we don't give recommendations on you should buy this mule or you should buy that mule. There's just too many variables uh, to make that a fair deal for you or a fair deal for anybody else. That said, what we can do is we can equip you with things that you want to look for things that you want to pay attention to and things maybe you want to think about as you're you know going about the process of purchasing a mule. Now Jill, I'll share a link to where you can um, read a little bit more on Steve's thoughts about purchasing mules. But Steve, um, question is what would you want Jill to look for and are there any and more specifically are there any traits that you would want uh, if you're going specifically to purchase an animal for uh, children? 
Yeah, you know, here's the thing with, with kids, you know, they have no fear, uh, they can ride. It's frustrating to me today uh, to know what I did yesterday when I had my kids, I didn't have helmets. We never even thought about helmets for kids on bicycles and now they do. Uh, now what I can see in result of somebody's head hitting the ground and the problems there. Anyway, long story short is this, training, training, training. There is no such thing, folks. Get this in your mind. There is no such thing as a trained mule, okay? It don't exist. It's, it's, it's only as good as your communication skills are. And what I mean by that is this. My mules have, uh, the number one thing is disposition before anything else. You want disposition, disposition, disposition among anything else, okay? And here's what I'm talking about by trained. My mules have a foundation. They know how to side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hang, hind quarters. They know how to pick up their feet. They know how to be led. They know how to accept a bit. They know how to stand still and quiet. That's a foundation, okay? They know how to stand still for, for a vet. That's all part of a foundation. Trained, here's the problem. All right, here it comes. When it comes down to taking a clinic, I used to take a couple of my mules to clinics and then I would ride them. I didn't have them for sale, never had mules for sale when it comes to these clinics, okay? Now, did I used to sell mule 25 years ago? Yeah, okay, but that's another story. I would show and demonstrate to people in the audience before my clinics, this is what a mule with a foundation does. This is how they work. This is how they go. This is how you do a side pass. This is how you, I, and I used to, Everybody can see that mule did everything that I asked. And then I would say to the audience, who here has been riding 20 years? And hands would fly out. And then I'd say, come on down here and ride this mule, mule sir or ma'am, whatever. They climb on that mule. Folks, 15 minutes later, my mule, my trained mule, as some people would put it, looked like it wasn't even trained. Why? Because that person only had the basic skills, basic skills of communicating with the mule. Plus they didn't know how to listen to a mule. And that's one of the things we're doing in Superior, by the way, is it's called listen to your mule. Okay. So I said, I'll say this, I may sell you, which I don't sell no more, mules, and tell you that the mule is kid safe, woman safe, traffic safe. No such thing, folks. No such thing. The mule is only going to be as good as you. Now, I have seen some really good mules that I've been training on in a wagon, and I'm going down the road, cars going by left and right. All of a sudden, here come this one vehicle, Pull on a trailer that was a little rattly. The mules that I were going along really good now became really rattled. All mules, get this in your mind, all horses, all donkeys have a flight and res response out of fright. All of them. I don't care how well they're trained. When it comes to flight and fright, they will flight simply because, and get this in your mind, they will flight simply because something startled them. And I'll use the analogy you've heard me say many times. I'd be in my house. My wife would be working in her kitchen. She's in her atmosphere. She's doing the things she loved to do. She knows I'm in the house. And all of a sudden I come in and say, honey, ah! you all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you've been there, startled. Yeah, startled, yeah. And so it, it, it's, it's frustrating, sure it is. But let me tell you, the mule is only gonna be as good as you, you know, period. I can give you a lot of other suggestions, you know, like for instance, I was riding a, a 20 plus year old mule, been there, done that mule, been there, done that. And I know it been there, done that because I've been there and done it with it, okay? 
along with a good, very good friend of mine, Randy, okay, Biggins. And this meal was punch cows, work cows, seen rattlesnakes, seen dogs, seen cattle, seen deer, seen all kinds of stuff. And I'm riding this nice meal. 20, I think you're around 24 years old, but a well-minded meal. And I'm watching what I'm doing. I'm riding, you know, I'm not just sitting along, just thinking around. I'm riding a mule. I ride a mule. I have my legs on that mule. I have my 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 body on that mule. I have my hands on that mule. I got to feel. Okay, it's kind of like driving your car. If I let go of the steering wheel, it's going to go anywhere it wants to go. Same thing with that mule. Don't allow your mule to look around, gog around, left and right, and goggle out. They're going to be looking for monsters. So now here, let's go back to my story. You understand? This mule has a solid foundation, has over 20 years of being out on the side of a mountain. Not just trail riding, punching cows, doing work, hunting, things like this. Over 20 years. All of a sudden, out from the left-hand corner, come my border collie puppy. At that time, he was two years old. He come out and he startled my mule. This mule jumped and went to bucking and running off. I stayed with him. I right, left, right, left, right, left. I, I made that meal solid. Made him stand still then after that. Was I sore? I was sore four or five months later. Because when you have a thousand pounds hit you behind, between the legs, that, that don't feel good. Okay. And I was black and blue from my knees to my belly button, folks. Yeah, that happens. That's why I've got 32 broken bones and two replaced hips. Why? Because animals are animals are animals. Don't listen to anybody, ma'am, about your kids especially. I can tell you some horror stories about kids and mules and donkeys, and I don't want to get into that. But I'm going to tell you, put a helmet on your kid, put a helmet on you, your mule, and enjoy the trail ride. Awesome. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, next question that come in. Uh, this one was from one of our friends in France, and so we've got a little bit of a translation uh, game that we're playing here, but we'll do our best. Um, I have purchased a used saddle, a used Steve Edwards saddle, and it does not fit my donkey at all. Um, I have the saddle pad that goes with it. Do you have a reason why it's not fitting? Uh, and this is from Karina over in France. So Steve, uh, as best we can... What are some of the mistakes, the common mistakes that people make when it comes to putting the saddle on their mule or their donkey? Okay, mistake number one, they don't take the time to watch the video I send them. Number, number one's the mistake, okay? Anytime somebody tells me that my saddle doesn't fit, they haven't watched my video. Because here's, here's one of the mistakes. They put it on the donkey or they put it on the mule and they got their hand on the horn, hand on the cantle, and they rock it back and forth and say, see, well, it, look, it rocks. It better rock, folks. It better rock. Why is that? Because your mule and your donkey have a pat, fat pocket at the sixth and seventh rib. It's the same place where your front latigo is, okay? And that latigo there, when you are rocking your saddle back and forth it is rocking over that fat pocket okay when it comes down to my trees is a 19 and a half inch bar 19 and a half inches all right my dog's got a little bit of a stomach ache so i've been kind of watching him so if you see me look over my shoulder if i hear him gag i'm kind of watching so he's okay what i did was is I change feed on him because we ran out of regular dog food. And think about this with your mules too. It, he ended up, I ended up feeding him uh, what was called pedigree and it didn't agree with him. And he's got an upset stomach and, he's, and his bathroom has not been good. Anyway, so I'm been watching him. So let's go back, okay? That's one, let's go back to the tree. The bar itself is 19 and a half inches. It's that size because of mules being smaller and longer in this sort of thing. I found 19 and a half inches works very good because my saddles go from a 14 inch to a 17 inch, no longer, okay? So as far as seat size. Now, on that 19 inch bar, I want 15 inches out of that 19 inches 
actually being consistently touching the animal? Where do I not want it to be putting pressure against the donkey? Is right in the very front, right where the scapula goes up and down. And then behind that, there's this area where the cinch comes down, okay? And when you over tighten that, the back of the saddle comes up and the saddle is cantilevering. Where do you see white spots on your equine? You always see them, horses, don donkeys, mules, are all equine. Where do you see the white spots? In behind the scapula. Why is that? Because we over tighten the back cinch and the front cinch, I mean, we over tighten the front cinch and the, the back of the saddle is doing this cantilevering. What's it doing? Putting pressure right here. If we would tighten the front cinch and snug the back cinch where it's laying tight against the belly, if we would do that, then your saddle would not cantilever. It would be in place as it's going down the road. Your saddle is allowed to move an inch and a half forward and back, left and right. Okay. So on that 19 inch bar, I do not want it to be touching the front of the saddle. If you over tighten the, the front cinch, the back of the saddle is going to come up and it's going to cantilever. Now, here's one of the downsides is I'd like to know what she wants to tell me here. When she says it doesn't fit, I want her to tell me why, why she thinks it doesn't fit. Because here's the thing, folks. When I used to do my clinics all around, and I will be doing it in Superior, Arizona, uh, Montana, and I will be doing it when I'm doing my clinic in Tennessee, which we'll be talking about later on. I'll have my bars there and I'll demonstrate. So let's go back. When it comes down to that bar, that bar sets on every mule and donkey I've done all over the world. There's no difference between a donkey in France and a donkey in the United States. I've ridden uh, and trained on donkeys and mules in Egypt and Brazil and, and Israel and, and Australia. And the first thing that I'm going to tell you is the bone structure of that mule is in that uh that's that's in that mule is the donkey so i've taken the donkey bone structure the way it is and and i and i fit in my trees so that i had consistently here's the problem i was just talking to a guy the other day he's had saddle makers to say they take wires and put wire measurements on the animal in four places and then they send them a tree here's the problem they are measuring only the muscle mass only muscle mass that changes a mule or a donkey can lose up to 100 pounds just in one weekend ride so you don't measure muscle mass you go by the bone structure so uh, i'd like her to maybe send me a video okay and i can help you out uh, but let's go back if i take and measure a mule or a donkey in january when he's fat and been sitting around and I measure a mule in July after he's toughened up and been ridden and stuff, we're gonna have two different measurements, okay? The way I found out what the best way for angles and everything for my mules and my donkeys was this. I developed, I was part of developing an adjustable pack saddle with Abe Hewitt from Canada. And the bars, they, they, they moved back and forth and the arches made it wider or narrower. Okay, and I was able to figure out the angle and I was able to figure out an inch and a half from the spine to the edge of the bar. Every mule and donkey all over the world, that's the same measurement that I've used and it's worked very well. So uh, let's go back. When I, when I would go and do clinics and I would take a horse tree and I would put my tree on the mules and I, you could see the actual fit of the mule and the donkey. Here's the problem. When you look at a saddle, you have skirting and skirting does not show you how the bar is actually setting on the mule. For instance, I had one lady send me a picture. She says, look, I've got a gap in the back of my saddle in the, in the spine. I've got a gap back there. And I 
text her back. And I said, yes, you know, watch the video. It tells you the reason you're doing that is because I want the, the saddle up off of the spine. Okay. I want it up off the spine and I don't want it sitting flush on the animal's back. Then you'll start getting where, where the saddle has been rubbing on the back of the mule because, or the donkey, because of this folks, the mule and the donkey, okay, are very lateral when they're walking. So they use that very easy single foot walk, okay? And that's, if you have a saddle that the, that the uh, skirting is laying flush against the animal, you will start creating problems in their spine and on the hip. I can keep on going. The best thing to do, Dave, is point them toward uh, how to uh, mastering the saddle fit, mastering the saddle fit, which we have on my website. And I'd be interested in this lady with a donkey who says it doesn't fit her donkey hot. I'm sure she's not quite looking at things. It's impossible to see if the saddle is going to fit with skirting and all on it. Yeah. So one of the things that we've seen over the course of the last you know, 20 years or so, at least since I've been involved, is often, um, you know, just like when folks will get furniture at home that needs to be put together, uh, often, uh, you know, I got a Vitamix blender, Steve, and I sent Ooh. back the first one because I was like, this thing ain't blending anything. There's something wrong with it. Now, Vitamix blenders, those are $200, $300, $400 dollar blenders. Now, I got one on a really good deal. That's another story. So I get this Vitamix blender. It's supposed to pulverize everything. And I throw all this stuff in there and it just spins. It doesn't do anything. So I send it back. They send me another one. Same thing. And I was like, well, it's impossible that it's going to happen to two. So I started looking and I started reading and I found that I was, you don't put the ice in first. You put the ice in last. If you put the ice in first, it's not going to work properly. And so even though I had all the right ingredients, even though I had the best of the best blenders, if you don't use it the way that it was intended to be used and follow the instructions, you're not going to have a smoothie. All you're going to have is frustration. And that's what happens with the saddle too. You could have the right saddle. You could have it uh, with all the right equipment, but if you don't have the positioning correct, if you don't have the, um, the amount of length on the breast strap in the front, and the breaching in the back, if you've got the cinches tight in the front and loose in the back as opposed to the opposite, it's not going to work the way that it's supposed to. And all you're going to have is a big bag of frustration. And we don't want that. And we know that folks don't want that. So just hopping on a phone call and maybe exchanging some pictures is often, uh, is often the prescription that solves the problem and gets folks on their way uh, enjoying it the way that they hope they would in the first place. So if that ever happens to be you, uh, give us a call. We want to help you. We don't leave you high and dry and say, all right, sucker, here you go. No, uh, we send you a video. We show you how it works. We go out of our way to give you resources uh, so that number one, you can figure it out. But then number two, you can help instruct and show other people uh, in the future. So let us know how we can help. We want to help you. We want to make sure that you get what it is that you need and you're not frustrated because this should be a joy for you. It shouldn't sure. be frustration. So that's a great so question. Her, Thank, go ahead. Have, me, have her send me some pictures of the donkey saddle and maybe a little video of what she says, why it doesn't fit. So we can, then we can help her out now. You know, yeah, she didn't buy the saddle for me, but don't make any difference, folks. If you got a saddle from somebody else, or if you've got some, some questions, send me some videos, send me, we got some videos coming up here, some stuff, right? Huh, Dave? But, you know, we want to help you. All right. And the biggest thing, like Dave just said, the best of equipment, but if it's not put on and installed it right, you're going to have a problem. Awesome. Um, so let's hop back over and see who else is hanging out with us live. Uh, we've got Rory watching from Southwest Ohio, clear blue skies, 52 degrees, watching on YouTube, typing on Facebook. That's a man of many talents right there. Mr. Rory, uh, David Pingelli says, just lost the audio refresh, Mr. Pingelli, and it'll be right back. Uh, Dave O'Brien, one of our faithful and true East Texas, 87 degrees and sunny cowboy Ken, another faithful and true. Hello guys. Just finished snowing 33 in inches in Connecticut. Good grief. Rory Woo. says, brought, uh, bought, brought home a sweet little Molly, 54 inches at the Withers and built fairly stocky. So less than 14 hens. 
how much weight would you guess she could comfortably handle, rider or pack? Folks, it's not a matter of the size of the mule. It's a matter of the conditioning of the mule. All right. Now, let's just do this. I want you to take a 30 pound, put 30 pounds in your back, in your backpack. And I want you to walk around for the day, maybe for a couple of days and tell me how your back feels. Just throw it on there right now, you know, and spend the next couple of days walking around. You're going to be sore. But if you start exercising and start preparing yourself and things like this, you will be able to uh, get the mule, the donkey in condition so that you will be able to properly ride the mule. OK, uh, that's the biggest thing is conditioning. It's not a matter of the size, folks, because here's the thing. On the, on the mule's legs, there are tendons. And, and what happens so many times is you blow a tendon. You can have an upper bow tendon, a middle bow tendon, and a lower bow tendon. You can have that, okay? And basically what that amounts to is, this is the tendon right here. This is the hoof down here. And then this tendon goes up to the knee, okay, on the back side. And you feel it. You should, on a daily basis, and when you go riding, you should feel that tendon, and it should feel nice and firm all the way down. If it feels soft in any one place, you're starting to have a bowed tendon. In other words, they'll start kind of crippling up and barely go. So it's not a matter of how big the mule is. It's a matter of conditioning. There's lots of ways to cripple a mule. And sometimes, yes, it's at your weight. Now, I want to tell you this, that that industrial standards points out that 200 pounds is pretty much max for any mule. Whoa, that kind of that kind of makes it kind of tough, doesn't it? Because most of us are bad Americans. You know, I'm 205 pounds right now. And um, and that's 205 pounds. If I was at the Grand Canyon still, I wouldn't be able to pack my freight down the mountain because I have to be under 200 pounds. That's industrial standards. Uh, and that's carrying weight and this sort of thing. So think about that That's 200 pounds plus your saddle. So you've got to figure you've got 250 pounds on that mule. And if you're already 250 pounds, another 50 pounds, ah, 300, right? So I said, I'll say this conditioning, conditioning, conditioning. All right, hopping back over, saying hello to Joel watching from uh, Idaho. Snowy, sunny, windy, cloudy. We have whatever weather you want. Just wait five minutes for your change. Myra is watching live from Southern California. It's cold, but the sun is shining. Jared is watching, says, hi, guys. Steve, do you have any suggestion for dealing with white line disease? Thank you. What mm. is white line disease, Steve, and do you have any suggestion? Yeah, no, I, I don't. White Lyme disease, unfortunately, is not something you want to have happen to your equine. What it amounts to is this. Here's your spine, okay? Right here, this part here, this is your outer hoof wall. This part here is your white line or your lamina. And then this right here is your coffin bone. This lamina is the shock absorber between the outside wall and the, can and the uh, coffin bone. So when this lamina starts deteriorating, you no longer have protection for the coffin bone. And the coffin bone then starts rotating and tipping back because the outside wall is putting pressure on the lamina, which is starting to little by little dissipate and disappear, unfortunately. Okay. I have, um, I have shod animals in the past with laminitis and tried to help get the, the animal to walk correctly. I've taken a shoe and I've turned it around backwards to where instead of the opening of the shoe pointing in the back, it pointed to the front. 
and I nailed two nails in it, and that helped the animal with some relief. But lamina, uh, laminitis, unfortunately, is kind of a, it's a slow way of the mule crippling. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know of anything out there today, even with all the new ideas that we have, unless somebody out there can tell me something different. When it comes down to laminitis, it's pretty much, the mule is pretty much done, okay? Would I be riding that mule? No, no, because I'm coming down a mountain and all of a sudden that mule trips and falls and I fly off and I hit the ground. If I'm lucky enough, the mule doesn't roll over top of me. So that's just one example. In a wagon, they can trip and fall. In, in pack outfit, trip and fall. Anyway, they can all trip and fall. So is there a way to fix it? No, there's not. Can you help them by turning them out in a pasture and doing some corrective shoeing? Yes. Uh, but it depends on what stage your laminitis is as to how much, if you're going to ride it all. Me, personally, I would not ride the animal. I know he's suffering a lot and, uh, and I don't want to get myself hurt. All right, Steve, you had sent me some uh, content a little bit earlier in the week, and you said we want to take a look at this. So uh, I wanted to go ahead and give you an opportunity here to share uh, some uh, photos and videos that came in. I've got the photo right here. Let me know when you want the video. Yeah, go ahead and shoot a video here. This is Festus. Notice the come along rope and the sir single and the britching looking good. Nice stout little meal. Now, when you have a surf single on, the britching is not going to sit in the same place as it is when you have a, a riding saddle. It's going to be in front of the croup, and that's mainly because of the way you're using the uh, sur single. Now, notice he has the come along rope, and he also has the mule rider's martingale. So he's teaching his mule to pack a bit, and you'll start to there, right there's the end result. Notice, head is starting to come down. It's a little bit more difficult for this mule. Now see it's coming down, coming down real nice. Nose on the vertical, and it went back up, and now it's coming down again, and that's what's gonna happen. The thing with this, this mule here, he has kind of a big neck, and so his neck comes up out of his shoulders. And so it's more difficult when you have one the neck coming up out of the shoulders, it's more difficult for them to flex their neck and to get their head down. But you can see he was doing it little by little. Wonderful job there. Good job. Uh, I was trying to think of this guy's name, Leo. Um, I think I had it in here. Let me see here. Bruce, Bruce from Texas? Yes, Bruce Key. There we go. Almost sounded like Bruce Key, like a, like a beer. Bruce Key. <laughs> I that kind of different, didn't I? Okay, his name is Bruce Key, K-E-Y. And he's in Texas. As you can see, he's using the come along rope. He's using the surf single. What's he doing here? He's teaching his mule, letting his mule, and teaching his mule because he's setting him up for success to get the head down and nose on the vertical like that. When a mule has his head down and nose on the vertical like that, He's driving off his hindquarters and it gives, it rounds out his back and that gives you that nice ride. Okay. So good job, Mr. Keys. So one of the things that, uh, that this really highlights, Steve, we get folks messaging us probably four or five times a month saying, Hey, do you still train mules or Hey, can you put me in touch with someone who can train mules in my area? And if there's one thing that we have really discovered over the course of the last four years or so doing this program, it's that um, you, you don't you don't need to go outside and find and outside of your own circle and find someone to train. Really, you're capable of training. And um, what what have you found, Steve, has been maybe one of the biggest obstacles that, that folks think that, well, I can't train. I don't know how to do it. What are what are some of the biggest obstacles and, and what are they finding when you speak with them? Well, the obstacles, of course, is fear. They're afraid they're going to get hurt. Listen, you can get hurt on a well-foundationed mule. 
quote, trained. You can get yourself hurt. And I've already been talking about that. So when it comes to training, building a foundation, you're going to hear me say over and over again, writing is not the important part. Unfortunately, this is what trainers want to do because they know you want it. Okay. They want to see, you want to see that mule being ridden. Well, heck, if he's riding him now, he'll be good. And then I can just kind of finish him off. People think like that all the time. No, no. He'll, he, he, he will buck all mules, all mules, all donkeys, all horses, bite, kick, buck, run off. They all do. Okay. They all do. So if you do it yourself, like Mr. Key is, and you train on that mule or that donkey, and you use the very simple things that I show you, you'll be far ahead of any of these so-called trainers because their idea of training is he's being ridden. That's being, that is training. That is only training, folks. That is not building a foundation. What's this mule learning? This mule is learning respect for the halter, i.e. the come along rope. He's having respect for that lead rope. That's one, okay? The next thing is notice the bit and the bridle, the martingale. The proper bit and bridle that I use is that mule rider's martingale. Look, nobody's on that mule's back. Nobody's on his back and look where his head is doing. He's listening to the bridle and he's respectful of it. So where did he start with? Started with the come along rope, come along rope, come along rope. Not important to do the halter, not important. When people bring, when I was training, they bring me mules and to be trained on and donkeys to be trained on. Riding was not important to me. No, what was important to me was build a foundation so that the mule respected the bridle, respected the lead rope. If they did that, then the writing part is the icing on the cake. So what he's doing right now, he's getting this mule to go, he needs to go three, six, nine, twelve in a circle, at a walk, nice and quiet. If he stops at the gate, which they all do because they want out, they want to go do what the job is we train them to. What's that job? To go out and eat grass and drop road apples on the ground. Okay, they don't need to be doing that, folks. They look, if they're going to stand in the corral, they might as well stand in the corral with the come along rope and you work them, or they might as well stand in the corral with the surcingle and the bridle on them and learn how to respect that bridle. Notice that mule does not have anybody on his back. Mm -hmm. And the mule is listening to the bit. Right bit, right bridle right way to do a good foundation training congratulations mr key awesome awesome uh hopping back over let's see here we've got uh steve watching from delta colorado where it is cold windy and snowy uh we've got a question here any recommendations on the trimming and when to shoe young mules i'm currently with an eight month old and she is coming along pretty darn well so far. There's a lot of different information out there about shoeing as it relates to the mule and the donkey. Uh, what's your experience, Steve? Well, hey, one of the reasons we're seeing so many crooked legs on these animals is for one thing, uh, it comes from the jack. The bone structure comes from the donkey, folks. So all this crooked stuff, just look at your donkeys out there. Their legs, you know, their, their shoes are pointing, their hooves are pointing out to the right or to the left, or both ways, you know, uh, or they're pigeon-toed, lots of different things, mainly because when they were not, when they, when they were younger, they were not trimmed properly. So always take your babies and have them trimmed properly where their feet are straight, they're balanced, and, and you can do that uh, when, when you have your babies. So I usually start shoeing, Oh, it depends about um, two years and six months to, to three years old, I start shoeing. And, and they all got to be trained to stand still and quiet for shoeing. All right.
right, moving right along here. Uh, let's see. Merlin says, thank you, Steve. That answers my question and helps me with my selection of equipment. He was asking about beta. Neil is watching from uh, Linden, Tennessee. Neil and Elena, Tennessee, where it's 73 degrees. Sabrina is watching from Central Valley of California, where it is raining and 55 degrees. Hannah is watching from Dunnelin, Florida, 81 degrees and gorgeous. Neil and Elaine say, our donkey got out about two weeks ago. Had to rope him to catch him. Used the come along rope to get him through the gate. Now he is scared of it. That what should I do now? Don't worry about it. Just get the come along rope and go at it again. Listen, you're gonna have him do the same thing about the saddle. You're gonna have him do the same thing with the bit. They're gonna get scared of it. They're even gonna get scared of you. All right. And I've had people tell me that. Oh, they didn't use the come along hitch anymore. And they went to the nylon halter and they, oh, I made a big mistake. Now I can't control him at all. Yeah. So don't worry about it, folks. It's, it's part of life of an equine, just like it's part of life with you. Okay. Yeah. Once you've had a traumatic thing, you, you are, you need to work your way through it. Okay. That's like these mules and donkeys. I've had them rare in the air. I've had them flip over backwards. I've had them run off. I've had them do all kinds of stuff with that come along rope. And I was able to control them. Don't worry about it. They're scared. They'll get over it. Okay. It's just that you got to have time. Now, here's the thing. Don't let anybody tell you about using treats, all this sort of thing. You don't have a dog. You've got a mule. They're an equine. And that's really, really, really important for you to remember. Uh, folks. So, you know, they're looking for a herd leader. A, a, a herd leader will bite them and kick them. Yes, they will. Bite them and kick them. Okay. Now, of course, you're going to be a lot easier on them than that, but don't be afraid to smack them. Okay. Don't be afraid to get after them because if you don't, they'll end up turning the tables and you'll be the bottom of the pecking order. Uh, continuing on here, Barbara's watching from beautiful Missouri, sunny and 70. I should be working with my Molly, but I am still at work. Well, now you got something to look forward to, Barbara. We've got, uh, Jem watching from Alabama where it's 75 degrees and clear. Nice. Megan says, I am having a few issues with my mule. I've had him for two months now. He's doing really well. However, he's always been a handful for haltering. I've tried putting a treat, but he knows and won't stick his nose in there. A few days ago, I went to put his halter on, and I had my hand over his nose to put it on, and he jumped out, put his le front legs on my shoulder. He is gelded. I did not put any weight. He did not put any weight on me and got off right away, but it was still a rattling experience. Is there any advice for me how to work with him? Well, first thing I always do, folks, is I want to make sure my animal's just as soft when I end as when I begin. So here's what I do. And this is where people make a lot of mistakes. Is when I take and I train my mule to, number one, drop the head, tip the nose to the left. In my last clinic here, I, I showed that on two or three different mules. I wasn't interested in putting the come along rope on. I wasn't interested in putting the halter on, okay? But I did put my hand behind the ears, just no pressure, just there. And my left hand, my right hand behind the ears, my left hand on the nose. And all I did was hold it there. When he dropped his head, I took my hands off, put my hands back on. He dropped his head, take my hands off, put my hands back on. At the same time, when I take and tip the nose to me, so my left brain is watching me, okay? What do I do there? I just simply put a little pressure, a little pressure with my finger, a little pressure. They feel that pressure and they'll come away from it. Pretty soon, the proper way, folks, with a good foundation mule and donkey is they tip their head drop their head to accept the bit. Somebody somewhere along the road has taught the mule, put your head wherever and I'll put the halter on. Put your head wherever and I will put the bridle on. No, 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 folks. 
You want them to be soft. And the way you have them to be soft is this. Put your hand behind the pole, hand on the nose. They eventually bring their nose over and drop their head and accept the bit like this. We got some video of that, Dave, of my uh, of working with them. Mills, do we have anything right now? Uh, I mean, I don't have anything pulled up right away, but um, I've got, I mean, we've got all sorts of awesome videos, playlists even. We've got a playlist on YouTube, Establishing Leadership, and it really goes from, I can't approach my mule and get my mule to come to me on my terms, all the way to leading them with the come along rope. We've got all sorts of videos, a playlist on installing the come along rope, and that includes uh, approaching them, and that includes getting them to be soft and stand still. So that's it's all there on YouTube. Y'all go check it out. Um, just start free. going through one video at the next. It is absolutely free. And here is the sound fact. Right there, absolutely hey, hey, free, well, folks. Hey, the gal was here with was from France. Whoop! There's my dog. Call my dog. Yes, guys, I'm excited. Hey. So the lady from France, we didn't give her the glockenspiel. Oh my goodness! International. There we go. Okay, so I think probably the that little uh, video clips of uh, of. Um, what did we call it with a, establishing uh, leadership establishing leadership okay uh that would be a good one for her you know awesome I'll you gotta remember to folks when, when you buy a mule from someone get this in your mind i want everybody to listen to me pingali you too okay when you buy a mule from someone they're gonna have holes in them they're gonna have holes that's when people would bring me animals to be trained. I didn't just climb on them and ride them. The first thing I started doing was groundwork, 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 groundwork. Sir single work, sir single work, sir, sir single work. Halter work with the sir single. Bridle work with the sir single. Finishing bit with the sir single. All of that. Three months worth before I even thought about riding because I'm looking for holes. I'm looking for problems, okay? And problems can be the smallest thing. So just think about it. Don't listen to these people who say, he's been there, done that meal. They don't exist, okay? I already told you about that, okay? They, they don't exist. Kid, kid safe meal, they don't exist. Woman safe meal, not exist. They don't, not even for a man, folks. <laughs> Why, remember what I told you earlier? Listen to that. It's really, really important. So what's next there, Dave? What do we got? We got seven minutes left. Yep, we got a few left. Jerry's watching from Indiana where it's warmer weather today. Jack is watching from Johannesburg where it's 35 and sunny. Six fresh inches of snow last night. Uh, Moonin is watching, says, I've been looking at a four-year-old molly mule that has not been trained. Can you comment on a molly mule, and is it a smart move to purchase a four-year-old untrained mule? Well, somebody has somewhere or another done something with that mule. You can bet, okay? When I say, when that's part of what I call training. Even if you took him and, and ran him in from the pasture into a corral, you've trained on him. Even if you've led him from A to B, you've trained on him. You may not have built a proper foundation, but training is anything you do out of the norm of what a mule and donkey usually does. And what do they usually do? Eat and drop road apples on the ground and, and water, and they like being with one another. That's their, that's their life, okay? Training is that when you open the gate, from the minute you open a gate, you are training. In other words, you're teaching the mule what a human does. That's exactly what you're doing. You're training a mule, you're teaching a mule or a donkey what a human does. So they learn what a human does, and they learn to get around you. Why? Because you're a predator. They're a prey animal. You're automatically at odds. So what do you have to do? You have to build leadership. That one little series there that we've got there, that's a good one for that people can understand there, Dave. Good idea. Awesome. I put a link there to get to that. 
Uh, let's see here. John is watching in uh, snowy Utah. Can you review the leg and bit cues you use when riding and the cues you train with on the ground to prepare them for the riding cues? Now, this is pretty elaborate. Steve, is there anything that you mm. could say that's in short term on this? Or yeah. there's some... We've got some instructional videos, I think, but I don't know if we have anything that's so elaborate on YouTube. Well, you know, we've, we've got the one uh, uh, basic equitation, which gives you a lot of things, but you're talking about five or six hours worth of training to tell you, even in the beginning of how to get a mule or a donkey to side pass, turn on a forehand, turn on a high quarters. I would need to have something here to show you where to put your legs and your hands. I would need to be able to have the mule or donkey with me to be able to use my hands to show you how to do it. Uh, all of my instructional videos show parts of that at different times. Uh, where to place your hands, uh, to, that'll be like your legs. Think about your legs. When you're riding, your legs are straight up and down, okay? Now, basically you have where your leg sets, okay? That's your leg. And when you move it forward, four inches, you're turning on the hindquarters. So in other words, you're putting pressure on that front end and the mule moves off. When you take and move your, your, your leg back four inches, so, so I mean back four inches, so like here's the leg as, as you're riding and you take and here's your leg when you're side passing four inches back. So you have to use your hands at the same place where your stirrups go. Having that pressure there, asking, telling, demanding. It's one of the things that I do on my clinics uh, that I'll be doing uh, in, uh, in Superior and also in Shelbyville, Tennessee, when I do the uh, uh, American Mule and Bluegrass Festival in, in October. Yeah, um, looking forward to that too. Yeah, so you've got a couple opportunities to see Steve that are up on the calendar. You've got Montana, June 2nd through 4, and then you've got uh, out in Shelby, Tennessee, the American Mule and Bluegrass Music Festival. So it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, awesome opportunities to hang out with Steve. Uh, let's see here, moving right along. Pete is watching from Vast, North Carolina, sunny and 75. Rory says, 30 pounds on my back. Nope, not favorable. Hard enough to carry my clothes all day. I will start her out easy and get her condition. That sounds like a idea. listening right there. Hey, yeah. we've gone international. <laughs> Di Scholl and David Scholl are watching from Queensland, Australia, where it is hot and dry today. Doing a road trip to pick up three lady donkeys to mate with our little Teamsters Jack. So they've got their hands full there. Can't wait to see them in June. Roger from Milan, New York is watching from cold and flurry land. Yuda is watching, says 100% correct. It is me to let go. I think they are just going to be suffering. Uh, Yuda says, Yuda from Germany, uh, uh, now in South Carolina. Sunny and warm. Love, love. All the great info. Info, Love the come along rope. There we go. Julie is watching, says there are many treatments for white Lyme disease. However, laminitis is very difficult, if not impossible to treat. Most of the time, you're just offering a more comfortable life. Yep, that's what we were getting at there. Leroy says, surround yourself with folks that will remind you that you can do it. Angela not from West Virginia watching on Leroy's account. So yeah, you can train. You can make it happen. Surround yourself with folks like in these broadcasts right here with folks who have done it and will tell you that you can do it too. Linda the Mule Servant and Theo the Sweet One-Eyed Mule in Muddy Central Ohio. Karen from Central West Virginia. Happy to hear y'all live today. I am happy to be alive today too, Karen. I'm sure Steve is as well. Bill, sharing to Mules of Ohio, 48 degrees and sunny for a welcome change. Thanks for everything. Jim watching from Alabama where it's 75 and clear. Megan says, I am ordering a come along rope. <whistles> welcome to the club, Megan. It's good to have you. Uh, and that's it for today. Steve, anything you want to say before we're all done today? Megan, don't order just the come along rope. Make sure that you get the, the, the kit. You've got to have that how-to video, which will help you out, okay? So what else? Yes, the Superior Clinic is quickly filling up. Uh, we just had uh, Marana Trout from 
Arkansas, I think it was, uh, Mountain Home. Yep. And she, she's now renting the cabin, and I think she's bringing her uh, her husband with her there and this sort of thing. So, uh, and she's going to be a spectator. She's flying in, folks, flying to Missoula and going to the Superior Clinic. Now, the Superior Clinic, you can't just show up. You've got to pre set up for the spectator and for the the participant. So if you if don't 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 expect to just walk in and here I am, you've got to be pre-registered. Yep. Okay. Now for the American mule and donkey thing, that right there, Dave, is for veterans to help veterans. And you know me, man America comes first veterans come first all right so i am there not to uh do anything but to help the veterans so this is the deal you can come to any of my clinics they don't cost you a dime but they do going to cost you because i want you to support the veterans you give any denomination you want to give minimum of a thousand dollars anyway yeah, and, and and i want you to think about helping the veterans. So that's why I'm going to be there. Uh, I was just talking with uh, Marty Ray and he sounds like he wants me to do a, a packing clinic as well. So here's the deal. When I'm going to be there in Shelbyville, I'm coming there for free for the veterans. I want you to donate anything you can donate. You can go online to American Mule and Donkey uh, Celebration and, uh, and you, can, you can donate. And that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, I've got the American Mule and Bluegrass Festival website in the comments section. Uh, Y'all, they are doing, uh, let me see here, festival, there we go. They, uh, on their website, it is uh, AmericanMuleAndBluegrassFestival.com. Um, entry ticket prices will be donation only, so uh, be thinking about what you can do. Um, I, I heard a great message at my church a while ago, Steve, of course, uh, if we're here in America, we are in the upper echelon. We are in the top 1% of everyone in, in the world. And uh, and I think about that. And I'm like, why, why, why is it that I'm here and somebody else is somewhere else? And it, it's the wrong way to think about it. The reality is you play the cards that you've been dealt. And we have a responsibility to play those cards responsibly, to play those cards to render the best out of it. There's that parable. Where the uh, where the owner gives you know the same amount of money to three different peoples. One of them invested it with interest. One of them invested and made more money. One of them didn't do anything for fear. And the third one was was la was was kind of got a tongue lashing. Said, "I why didn't you at least put it in? We've got the ability to give an account for what we do with our money. And so just consider if you're going to go to Shelbyville, consider what it is you could give, what it is you could donate to help all of the efforts that these folks at the American uh, Music and Blue American Mule and Music Bluegrass Festival um, are going to be doing to help support our veterans, to help support folks who have given so much. Uh, what can you do? I love that. I think that's awesome. Steve, thank you so much for being here again this week. Thank you so much for everyone hanging out with us. We had a great group of folks here today. It sure is fun showing up every single week and getting to see y'all. And I know that we have not met a lot of you face to face, but we fully intend to. And when that day comes, my hope is that uh, it will be just like, oh my goodness, it is just like seeing them online. It is just, they are the same way that I remember them in the chat. They are the same way. So we sure do hope that we get to see you in Montana and uh, Tennessee. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and we will see you next week. God bless. Blessings.